Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to our service of worship. So glad you're here. I think you just may be in the right place at the right time. I know I certainly feel that way. I'm just feeling great about today. I was feeling great coming in this morning, and I've already gotten to participate in the first service, and I just, uh, just feel like, you know, God is moving, and the Spirit is moving, and this is just a, this is just a great time and a great place um, to be able to meet God and connect, and uh, to connect with our neighbors, connect with our Lord. And so I pray that um, you will feel God's Spirit among us. Um, in the midst of our service today. Um, we've got the Tylon String Band that's here that will be leading us in music today. Let's give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Pastor Julia is going to be preaching, and she's going to do a great job for us. She's got a great message for us. Pastor David is back after sharing the gospel in all kinds of exotic places.
here. When I was looking for a place to get married, I heard about this cool female pastor, and we've been here ever since. Uh, this church has nourished and supported us in ways too numerous to list. Uh, today, I want to talk about my experience as a 13-year cancer survivor. Um, those six months of undergoing the chemo were uh, made more bearable because of many of you here today. Um, I learned four great lessons during my time as a cancer patient at a school that stick with me for the rest of my life. I've already forgotten one of them. <laughs> so, nonetheless, I'm going to give you the three that I can call. One, there is no such thing as a small act. Every car, every meal, every phone call, every time, they all matter more than you can know. My college roommate's mother, who was a breast cancer survivor, sent me a card every week for 24 weeks. When we had a I'm well party, once it was over, we stapled all the cards on the fence in our backyard, and it was overwhelming. Uh, no one set out to fix my issue. They just sent me a card. But it all contributed to something larger. I told the group that day that I had seen the face of God, and then I pointed at everyone. Uh, two, if someone offers to do something to help and you sense that they need it, then give them something to do. This is not the time to play hero ball. Uh, your friends and family need to know that they did something in your time. Of year, so don't take that from them. Three, if something is worth doing in the name of God, then do it well. A friend from my Sunday school class offered to mow my yard, so I let him. He would do it, right? Uh, he didn't just mow it, he brought a trail full of food. He weeded the edge. Our backyard was shocked. See such tools. <laughs> Around this time, Bob Bowman told me about a woman who found a forgotten freezer in her basement with a turkey inside. It had been there about 20 years. She called Bud Hall, or whoever you call things like that, and they said, Well, if the power stayed on, the turkey's probably still out of it. It's likely lost its flavor. She said, Okay, I'll give it to the church. <laughs> Think God deserves better, He deserves our best. The question is, what does that look like? For cancer survivors, that question is a little different, though equally poignant. Uh, when I struggled early during chemo, there were fellow patients who held my hand who I knew would make it. They died and I didn't. Why was I the lucky one who survived? Why am I still here? Uh, I'd love to report that surviving cancer or any trauma brings clarity or purpose. It does not. It doesn't even correct the thoughts you had before. In my case, it does bring a certain impatience. Many of the time I've been in a situation I didn't survive cancer just to do this or for this to happen. All of which brings me to my work as outreach chair. Uh, we have people who are hungry, yet Mother Hubbard's cupboard shelves are dwindling. We have people who can't get their home into their homes, yet warm struggles to find volunteers to build ramps. We have disabled children and adults who never get to be the hero in athletics, yet too few of us know about the miracle field. There are some things we are not meant to tolerate. Today, I'm asking you to join me in a holy intolerance. I'm announcing today some breaking news. Uh, our committee wants its primary focus to be on supporting teachers in our high poverty schools, specifically Snipes Elementary, but there's others. We're calling it Teach Reach to play on outreach and you'll hear a lot more about it soon. Uh, we know by now the struggles that Snipes has had, but did you know Rachel Freeman, just a few blocks away, out of 1,514 elementary schools in North Carolina is literally the lowest rank in the state. Meanwhile, two others, one of them right up the street, are in the top 10. How does this disparity exist? It's because we as a community tolerate it. What if we became the church that supports teachers with a card, a cup of coffee, a meal? What if we collect or sponsor supplies for their classrooms? What if we buy uniform clothes, underwear, and socks for children and let the guidance counselors shop for their students' needs? During the week in which he knew he was about to die, Jesus told his followers, Give to those in need from the core of who you are, and you will be clean all over. Who was he talking to? I believe he was talking to me. I'd like to think he was talking to all of us. Uh, if you're so moved, give to the church and designate it for Teach Reach on the memo line. Um, next month, we're starting a drive to collect children's books. 60% of poor families don't have a book in their home. 
Many of you uh, have children who've outgrown their children's books, and so here's a place to bring them. So this is a win-win. None of us have outlived whatever has happened in our lives so we can watch children fail for lack of attention. So please join our team. Become an ambassador. Uh, it just means I'll let you know when opportunities arise. Uh, sign up on the bulletin board outside this door. I'm looking for people specifically to adopt teachers for the coming year. I hope you'll support Teach Reach, but just let us know what moves you to act, and we'll help match you to an outlet. We can't individually or as a church lift children out of poverty ourselves. We can bring in a box of books. We can read to a child in school. We can bring a teacher a Danish and a card. So please join our effort. There is no such thing as a small act. Thank you. As the Tideline String Band comes uh, back, um, I'm going to ask our church member in connection to the group, Keith Carter, if uh, he'll introduce the rest of the band. Timeline string band, we kind of fly around Western Beach. We've been playing together probably seven years. Uh, good bunch of fellas. It's, it's uh, fun to play with. Uh, we've got Billy Gus on the guitar, David Lyle on the bass, Ron Parsons on the mandolin, Albert Hall, Big Al Hall, and you'll find out why I'm in it, on the, on the claw hammer banjo, and Kevin Parker on the dope. <laughs> Don't you 
through this joyful music. Good morning, church. I'm Eun Soo Gang, one of the associate pastors here. It is a great joy to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Almighty God, we are so blessed to be gathered here this day, the first Sunday in Camp Meeting Month, seeking nourishment for our souls. You remind us of the blessings we have and the opportunities to share those blessings with others. We praise and we thank you for all these things and for your constant presence with us. Gracious God, we confess that we have fallen short of your glorious standard in our thoughts, words, and actions. We acknowledge our need for your forgiveness and ask that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who paid the ultimate price on the cross to atone for our sins. We are grateful that his sacrifice has provided us with a way to stand before you. We ask for the help of the Holy Spirit to guide us in overcoming the sin in our life. Empower us to resist temptation and to grow in our relationship with you, reflecting your love and grace to those around us. Loving God, we especially pray for these whom we now name with our voices or in our heart. Lord, we thank you for your healing mercies and your sustaining love for us. Bless all those whom we have named before you in our heart and with our voices. Touch each life with your peace. Help us to be faithful to you in all times and in all places. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we have time to offer our hearts and gifts, I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward to receive our tithe and offerings. Play one more. You might you might know this one. Please help us. Yeah. yeah please. When uh, Petey was there, this is one of his favorite songs. Go ahead.
All right, it's time now for the children's sermon. If I got any kids that would like to join me down at the front. good group this morning. So good morning, guys. Good morning. Wait a minute, my hearing aid's acting up. I, I didn't hear anything. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Oh, now it's working great. Well, I'm Pastor David. I'm one of the associate pastors, and I get to share the children's message with you this morning. But actually, I want to tell you about something that happened when I first got to church today. I was so embarrassed. I came walking in, carrying my bag, and Pastor Doug and Pastor Julia and Pastor Ensu all looked at me and said, what in the world do you have in that bag? I said, this is my camping equipment. And they said, what? I said, well, this is camping month at church. We're going camping, right? And they said, no, it, it's camp meeting. I said, yeah, we're meeting to go camping, right? And, and I mean, I've got my sleeping bag. Um, I've got my water bottle. I've got my camping pillow. have to have this. My camping hat. So my head, you know, might get a little sunburned on top. Um, I've got my lantern. Ooh, boy, that's bright. <clears throat> uh, and if I don't need that much light, I've got my flashlight. And, oh, one more very, very important thing. I've got my granola bar. <laughs> so, did I mention food yet? Yeah, well, so I'm, I was all set to go camping, and they said, well, no, that's not, this isn't about camping. Camp meetings are something that happened like 200 years ago in our country out on the frontier, which back then was like Kentucky and Tennessee and uh, the mountains of North Carolina and Virginia. And people used to come together from miles around. And that wasn't easy because they didn't have cars, they didn't have motorcycles, they didn't even have bicycles, so they had to walk or ride on horseback or come in wagons. And they would spend a whole week together, and they slept in tents because they didn't have motels, and um, they, they didn't have RVs, but they did have covered wagons. That was kind of like an early uh, RV. And uh, <laughs> yeah, work with me now, work with me. <laughs> and they cooked over open fires, and they had preaching all day and singing, and basically, it was a time when people really got excited about God and about their faith in God. And so at our church, they helped me to understand, when we have Camp Meeting Month, we're trying to recapture some of that spirit. Just like in this service, we have great uh, music, like right off the frontier. We have testimony and great singing and, and uh, preaching. We even had breakfast uh, upstairs earlier. It wasn't cooked over an open fire, but boy, was it good. Um, so that's what camp meeting is all about this whole month. Um, services that are informal, and really our goal is that we'll all get a whole lot more excited about God and about our faith. So let's pray together. Lord God, we just give you thanks for the children and youth of our church and community and their families. We just pray that you'll bless them and help all of us this month during camp meeting month to really get excited about our faith and excited about our church and above all excited about you, oh God, and your great love for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, guys, you can go back to your seats.
Good morning. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to get to bring you our message today. This summer, we are in the midst of a series where we are looking at the letters of the New Testament. Um, So as a reminder, these letters are written by a specific person to a specific group in a specific place at a specific time. Um, And today, our letter is the letter to the Romans. Um, If you want to pull out that little pink sheet that you have in your bulletin, you can read along. Um, Typically, we read from what's called the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version translation. Um, But today, I wanted to share something a little bit different with you. This is our passage in the message, which is a paraphrase. Um, So that means that when people were translating it from Greek, instead of um, normally a team gets together and they try to get every single word exactly right, And when you do a paraphrase, it's more like trying to get the meaning across, um, even if it isn't the exact words and grammar. So today, it can be a a great tool to use that, and I love the way that this passage sounds in the message. So hear now this word. But in our time, something new has been added. What Moses and the prophets witnessed to all those years has happened. The God setting things right that we read about has become Jesus setting things right for us. And not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. For there is no difference between us and them in this. Since we've compiled this long and sorry record as sinners, both us and them, and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us, God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to clear that world of sin. Having faith in him sets us in the clear. God decided on this course of action in full view of the public to set the world in the clear with himself through the sacrifice of Jesus, finally taking care of the sins he had so patiently endured. This is not only clear, but it's now. This is current history. God sets things right. He also makes it possible for us to live in his rightness. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me now in prayer? Holy and loving God, we, your people, are longing today to hear a word from you. God, I ask that in this time you would use me to speak to your people. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before our services this morning, I was chatting with Scott Wisnett as he was preparing to give a testimony, and he had seen the title of my sermon, and he asked, oh, is this a reference um, to G.K. Chesterton, who's a great writer and theologian of the 20th century? Um, And I said, no, it's a reference to that other great theologian of our time, Taylor Swift. If anyone here has probably listened to the radio at all in the past nine months, then you will likely have heard Taylor Swift's latest hit single, Antihero, which includes in the chorus the line, it's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. Not only is this song an absolute earworm, but it launched all sorts of funny things of people using that line to talk about times when they'd gotten it wrong or when they realized that they really were the problem. Well, like I said, in addition to this being a super fun song to listen to, as soon as I heard it, it reminded me of Paul's letter to the Romans. Now, in order for that to make any sort of sense at all, let's back up to the beginning of the letter. Paul's letter to the Romans is different than his letters to a lot of the other churches. And that's because usually when Paul was writing a letter, it was to a group that he already knew really well, perhaps even a church that he had started and spent years with. But when he wrote to the Romans, Paul actually hadn't met them yet. Paul sent this letter ahead of him because he was planning to go visit the Romans, but he had been delayed in his travel. So he sent this letter ahead to explain the story of the gospel. 
Remember, this is only about 20 or 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. That means that things that we now just take for granted as fundamentals of our faith really hadn't been agreed on and solidified yet. For Paul, sending a clear summary of the gospel was especially important because there was a group of people who were going around to the early churches and telling them that in order to be a Christian, you first had to become Jewish. You can see the logic in that idea, right? After all, Jesus was Jewish and was a teacher of Jewish law. All of his disciples were Jewish, and Jesus frequently said that he was on a mission to the lost sheep of Israel. So it makes a lot of sense to think that Christianity would be an offshoot of the Jewish religion. The people who were pushing this position weren't trying to be exclusive. Gentiles, that is all of us, everyone who wasn't born Jewish, could become a Christian, but it was just that in their minds, being a Christian also meant being circumcised and following the Jewish laws. But Paul believed something different. Paul was convinced that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ had changed everything. He was convinced that in Jesus, God had found a way to set the world right apart from the law, and yet at the same time that the law still mattered. Paul's letter to the Romans is essentially answering the question, what does Jesus' life, death, and resurrection mean for the Jewish religion, for how we live, and for the world? Paul's audience was mostly Jewish Christians. So he starts off the letter by trying to convince them that pious Jews, and not just Gentiles, are guilty of sin. In the first chapter of Romans, Paul describes how the Gentiles have fallen victim to the powers of sin. He gives this litany of practices that the Gentiles have been committing, things that any Jew would have found abhorrent. Idol worship, sexual immorality, you name it. Paul would have had all of his Jewish listeners nodding and saying, yeah, that's exactly right. Those Gentiles are awful. That's why they need to follow Jewish customs before they can be Christian. But then Paul flips the script. Not so fast, he says. And he gives this convincing betrayal of all the ways that the Jews have not been faithful to God's commands and promises. And he ends the critique with this absolutely gut-wrenching claim. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Wow. Suddenly the Jews are the ones who are under the microscope. And they have to wrestle with the fact that they are just as affected by the power of sin as the Gentiles have been. And in fact, it might even be a worse situation for them because God spoke directly to them. God had asked them to be the light to the nations and instead they had led the nations astray by living so poorly. They had to say, wait, I'm the problem? As some of you might know, I was a competitive cheerleader growing up. And sometimes when we were working on a routine and getting ready for a competition, our coach would give us corrections. Something like, hey, make sure that you're pointing your toes during the jump section. The problem was that she could give this critique several times in a row and the problem wouldn't get solved. You see, the issue was that no one thought that they were the problem. So I would hear that and think, oh, she's so right. Nicole is the worst about that. And I'm so glad our coach is finally calling her out. (laughs) Meanwhile, Nicole is thinking, oh, Julia's feet are always so flexed. And if she doesn't get her act together, we're going to get deductions at competition. Finally, our coach found a way around it. She started saying to us, assume that you are the problem. 
She said, even if you don't think it's you, make the change that would be necessary if it was you. The worst thing that can happen is that you'll become a better cheerleader. Well, it's one thing to use this strategy, this assume that you're the problem technique, when it comes to little things. But what about when you realize that you've been the problem in a more serious situation? This moment, this moment of admitting that you have done something wrong, that you are guilty, that perhaps you've hurt someone, is hard to bear. Brene Brown, who researches vulnerability, argues that there's a meaningful difference between shame and guilt. She writes that shame is always harmful, but she says this, guilt is adaptive and helpful. It's holding something we've done or failed to do up against our values and feeling psychological discomfort. Even though guilt is adaptive and helpful, meaning that it's necessary for us to grow and transform, it hurts to feel it. And we can go to extreme lengths to try to avoid feeling that pain. When we begin to feel guilt, our first instinct is to hide, to avoid confrontation. You can see this from the very beginning in Genesis. When Adam and Eve eat of the fruit from the tree that they were told not to eat from, what's the first thing they do? They hide. They sew fig leaves together to try to cover up their bodies that suddenly feel wrong and shameful. And when they hear God's voice, instead of running towards him, they run away and hide in the trees. We frequently also try to avoid guilt. Have you ever dodged a coworker because you know that you didn't meet that deadline on time or you had a disagreement in a meeting? Have you ever gone down the wrong aisle in Harris Teeter because you were trying to avoid someone that you had a falling out with? When avoidance doesn't work anymore, we usually then try denial. We deny doing what we did, that we say it was something or someone else. I know I'm certainly guilty of this. Oh, I wasn't late to the meeting because I left my house 10 minutes later than I knew I needed to leave. It was just that I got into traffic. Or maybe we justify. We try to say that what we did really wasn't that bad after all. Think about it. This is actually basically how court proceedings work. You can claim that you're innocent and try to say that you didn't do the thing that you are accused of doing. Or you can plead guilty but explain that there were extenuating circumstances that mean that what you did really wasn't so bad after all. Unfortunately, this passage in Romans doesn't give us the luxury of believing that our sin isn't so bad or assuming that the message is really just for someone else. The buildup to this passage has been to convincingly prove that both Jews and Gentiles are responsible for sin. Paul finally hits it home with this. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Message Bible, which we read earlier, puts it this way. For there is no difference between us and them in this. We've compiled this long and sorry record as sinners, both us and them, and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us. Everyone is guilty. Everyone means you. There is no distinction between us when it comes to our guilt. Regardless of what you have done or haven't done, all of us are incapable of living the glorious lives that God wills for us. But here is the beautiful thing. Hear what comes just after the verse that I read. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, 
They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Or again, here it is in the message. For there is no difference between us and them in this. Since we've compiled this long and sorry record as sinners, both us and them, and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us. God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. If there is no distinction between us when it comes to our guilt, that means that there is no distinction among us when it comes to what Jesus has done for us. Everyone is guilty. Everyone means you. The gospel is for everyone. And everyone means you. 11 years ago, my life was forever changed when I went to Lakeside for Youth, a Methodist summer camp in Ohio that's on Lake Erie. I'd been a Christian my whole life, and my family and I rarely missed a Sunday at the Episcopal Church where I grew up. I sang in the children's choir, and I went to Sunday school, and I was there every summer at Vacation Bible School. But around the time that I was in middle school, my family started going to a different church, a United Methodist Church. Now, maybe it was because the worship was a little bit different, or maybe it was just because I was a cynical teenager, but I was a little bit suspicious of this new church. And I was especially suspicious of the youth group. My parents would gently encourage me to get involved, but I found lots of clever excuses not to go. Finally, when I was 15, I was hemming and hawing about going to camp, so my mom finally just signed me up and told me I was going. You'll notice in the benediction that I always share with you, there's a line that says that God pushes us into places we might not go on our own. My joke with my mom has always been that the Spirit does that, and so do mothers. Well, I went to the camp, and it turned out it really wasn't so bad. There were some things that felt new and different to me, but I felt my heart stirring in a way that I had never felt before. Finally, on Thursday night during worship, one of the worship leaders stood up and said that if there was anyone who wanted to say yes to Jesus, that they could come forward and be prayed for. Well, as soon as she started saying that, I basically started rolling my eyes. I knew what this was. It was called an altar call, and it was one of those crazy things that might happen at a Methodist summer camp. (laughs) But at the very moment that I thought that, I felt another voice in my heart. It wasn't audible, but it was impossible to ignore. This is for you. I knew that it was God's voice, but I still tried to fight it. This isn't for me. This is for those people with big problems, the people who drink or smoke or are getting bullied at school or who aren't Christians. And yet, I still heard God's insistent voice. This is for you. Before my head knew what was happening, my feet started working. I went up to that stage, and I felt closer to God than I had ever felt before in my life. And from that moment of saying yes to Jesus for myself, my entire life has changed. I'm here now, all because of what started in that moment. Wherever you are today, whoever you are, this is for you. Whether this is the first time that you've found yourself in a church pew, or if you've been a Christian your entire life, this is for you. It's never too late, and it's never too early. This is 
for you. Everyone is guilty. Everyone means you. The gospel is for everyone. Everyone means you. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we thank you that you have proven in Jesus Christ that you will do anything to get to us. God, please help us today to realize that the gospel message is for us, to acknowledge our guilt, but God, then to know, too, that your saving work is for us. God, I ask that you would help us to say yes to you, to get on board with what you are doing in our lives. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to stand and join together in our closing hymn, which is found in your bulletin, Glory, Hallelujah, Jubilee. <laughs> A big thank you to the Tideline String Band for being with us today. As you go now from this place, go knowing that this is for you. And as you go, may the Spirit of the Living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way, go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace. <laughs>